Uh, Ken is a writer and a translator, and he's the winner of several awards, including the Nebula Hugo and World Fantasy Award. Um, he's got several novels out, including The Grace of Kings and The Wall of Strongs, which are part of his Dandelion Dynasty books, and with a third one on the way. And he's also the author of The Legends of Luke Skywalker, which is a Star Wars book. Um, he has a collection of short stories out, uh, The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories. And he's also well known for his translation of Chinese science fiction into English. Uh, he's translated Liu Tuxin's uh, Three Body Problem, and he has translated a collection of Chinese SF short stories called Invisible Planets. Um, so today, in his lecture, he's going to tell us about how and why we read science fiction, and what it means to use such stories as a way to think about the state of humanity and its potential. I just got that from the website. Okay, without further ado, Ken. Um, so, thank you, Jay, and uh, um, I, I should have asked Jay to set lower expectations. Uh, now I actually have to entertain you, which is difficult, but I will try. Um, so, there are two kinds of panels that I get invited to on literary festivals that I dread the most. One of them is the one where I'm asked to defend the very purpose and existence of science fiction. Why should we read science fiction? The other uh, kind sounds a little different, but it's actually very similar, which is this one. It's the one where we are, we, you, are, you are told that science fiction is very important, and I'm here to explain why. I, I hate these because, you know what, I got into sci-fi because I like pew, pew, pew. Um, and so I don't really have a lot of serious thoughts on this. So I'm here to show you a lot of pictures uh, and, uh, and we will look at pictures and explore this idea about whether sci-fi can predict the future um, and, uh, you know, what that means. All right, so let's start. Um, now, science fiction is a very old genre, and uh, unfortunately, most science fiction writers are not good artists. So I'm going to show you some futurism visual sci-fi where people used to think about what the future will be like in the year 2000. Um, so here is a series of postcards made in France between the year 1899 and 1910 um, by a bunch of artists who are really into futurism and thinking about the future. So this is one vision of what the future will be like in the year 2000, all right? So notice right away um, what's interesting here, uh, we have uh, something like a Roomba, I guess, is, uh, is what I would describe that. Um, now, do we think this is an accurate portrayal of life in the year 2000 or now? Um, apparently, everything uh, has remained pretty much the same as you would expect a 1900 living room of a rich person in France would be, and the maid uh, is remote controlling this Roomba to, to clear the floor. So this is, this is the future. Do we think this is a good prediction of the future? Hmm. All right, so let's uh, look at the second one. Um, here we have um, another postcard from the same series, envisioning war in the year 2000. Um, I do have to give the artist credit because whenever sci-fi is talked about and, and future technologies are discussed, um, war seems to be the grand focus and not domestic uh, events. And so I actually do give the artist credit for thinking about domestic things. But um, the accuracy of that vision, not so much. But look at this one, battle cars. Do we, do we fight wars in this way? Do we, do we think that the year 2000 looked like this? Um, here's, here's another one that I enjoy. Uh, uh, flying firefighters. Now, that actually would be a useful technology. Uh, we don't actually have that. Uh, now, this is one of my favorite. Um, this is an airship from France dominating the skies of Europe. Now, you'll see that there are actually little airplanes uh, in the back as well, but it is the airship that dominates the battle. Uh, the, the, this airship actually reminds me the most of my airships from the Dandelion Dynasty, but that's a fantasy book. 
so once again, as a matter of predicting the future in the year 2000, I think um, they are quite far off. So fiction becomes fact, not quite. Okay, so you'll say, well, Ken, you're being very unfair. These are, these are people from the 19th century. They were not scientists. They were, uh, you know, futurism was still in the future. They were just envisioning, entertaining visions for their readers. Why am I being so harsh on them? All right, so let's, let's look at some more serious visions of the future. So um, a lot of you might remember that uh, NASA was founded in 1958 and the Jetsons uh, went off the air in 1963. So 1958 to 1963 is a pretty important period in actual space exploration, futurism, and development. It also happens to be uh, the years during which uh, a series of comics were run in the Sunday papers called Closer Than We Think. These are visions of the future. So here we have a vision of uh, push button education. All right? So uh, the idea here is that there will be so many students and so few teachers, not clear why, but that's, that's the way it will be. So many students and so few teachers that education will be outsourced to machines. Students will sit in front of these lovely devices and push buttons to answer questions. And there will be a teacher who will explain things through videos. And, and if you're really having trouble, the teacher will come down and help you. Uh, a lot of things about this picture really, uh, I, I really love this picture. So one is you see that little guy over there being distracted by the girl in the flying bicycle, I guess, is what it would be. Um, so the, uh, the artist thinks that that aspect of high school life has not changed. Um, the other aspect uh, you will get from this image is that the future, uh, in the future, uh, apparently blonde people still get all the spotlight. <laughs> all right, so uh, let's look at this one. Uh, here is a vision of the future of cars. We are told that this is closer than we think back in 1958, right? That uh, um, I believe this is Chrysler's vice president who predicted that in the future, they will have such efficient solar cells that electricity will be stored in these storage cells and then power your car, much like gasoline. Okay, so you'll say, well, Ken, that's, that's clearly actually a very good prediction, right? We, we have that. Well, we don't. Do, do any of you actually drive this? Is it really closer than we think back in 1958? Or are we still talking about in another five to 10 years? Uh, one of the fun things that I, um, I noticed is that you have these people who predict about the singularity. So everyone knows what the singularity is about, right? This is the idea that AI will get to the point where it's so smart that technological progress will be taken over by AI doing research and we're just gonna go exponential with our progress and we'll all become one with the cloud and, and live as gods in that machine. Um, and, uh, and the technological singularity will be right there, we'll all be immortals, we will realize the most ancient dream of our ancestors, and it's just gonna be just the most glorious future imaginable. And if you ask the singularity uh, enthusiasts how far off that is, they're always gonna say 20 to 25 years. That was the case 50 years ago, and that's still the case today. Closer than we think, all right? So, I, I, I guess, um, the point here is, well, you know, these are futurists, so they get things wrong. Uh, what about actual real sci-fi, right? I still haven't gotten to real sci-fi. Uh, surely actual real sci-fi is great at predicting the future, yes? All right, so uh, let's, let's, let's take a look, right? Um, uh, do, we, do we run through our streets uh, hunted by time-traveling robots? Do we... Um, perhaps uh, send mission to Jupiter, where astronauts are terrified of, of their machine companion? Do we perhaps uh, uh, have a world in which there are people who are not actually people and we can't tell them apart and we have to ask them probing questions about empathy? Do we live in that world? 
uh, well, I mean, you might say this is all still unfair because I can at least think of one prediction in sci-fi from that particular film which has come true. So you see there are lots of people who look like people, but we don't know if they're people, looking for unicorns in this post-apocalyptic Los Angeles or California. Well, it turns out uh, if you go to uh, California, you do find a lot of people who may not or may or may not be people who are really, 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 really desperate about looking for um, unicorns. That, that is, in fact, what they do. This is one of the greatest industries in all of California. Um, uh, I, I, I talk to these people, and, uh, and it's very... I, I really am not sure whether they are machines or people, because they speak in this language that I have trouble processing as language. All right. So, I think we can sort of agree that sci-fi is actually not very good about getting the future right, okay? Even the most celebrated examples of supposedly sci-fi inspiring the future um, are, in fact, not really worth digging into. So one of the most often cited urban legends about sci-fi and actual technology is this idea that the Star Trek communicator inspired the inventor of the cell phone, Martin Cooper, to invent the cell phone. Okay? This is celebrated so much because you will see this sort of comparison online all the time. People put out the Star Trek communicator and they say, look at the Motorola Razor, it looks just like it. Um, and in fact, one of the popular apps on the iPhone early on was a, uh, an app that replicated the look of the Star Trek communicator, so you get that full circle effect, very meta. Um, here's the thing, though. If you talk to the actual inventor of the cell phone, Martin Cooper, uh, you get a very different story. Now, Martin Cooper did, in fact, at one point, say that he saw a scene in which Kirk called Spock on the communicator for help. And he said, ah, I'm inspired to invent the cell phone. He actually did say this. But uh, in 2015, he retracted that story. Um, he said, here's what happened. There was a film crew coming in to, to, to film a documentary called How William Shatner Changed the World. And they were so... He was so starstruck by these people that when these producers pushed the story on him, he sort of went along with it. And he said he's always regretted since. He says, no, no, I wasn't inspired by Star Trek. Star Trek had nothing to do with it. Uh, I invented the cell phone uh, because I was an engineer and I was like, working on real technology. No, Star Trek had nothing. William Shatner did not, in fact, change the world in that way. All right, uh, just not to beat the point, but, but I, I do want to point out that Star Trek communicators, I, I'm a geek, so sorry, indulge me on this. Star Trek communicators work on subspace communication frequencies, which is nothing like the radio waves on which cell phones work. Cell phones are called cell phones because they rely on towers arranged in a cell-like grid, okay? Very different, not at all the same technology. Okay, so my point, I think, has been made, which is sci-fi is no good at predicting the future of technology. So it's worth asking ourselves, why is that? Why is sci-fi so bad at predicting the future? Why is it that fiction does not become fact? Well, as it turns out, this is something that I, I think I know a little bit about. Um, I am a sci-fi writer. Uh, and I never take my own investment advice because I cannot predict the future. Uh, in fact, if we could predict the future, we would all be billionaires by investing in the right industries. And do you see many wealthy sci-fi writers running around as great investors? No, no, that, that's why we're sci-fi writers. But there is a reason why sci-fi is so bad at predicting technology. It's because of the nature of technological evolution itself. It happens that I did actually work for many years as a historian of technology of sorts. Um, more uh, precisely, I was working as a litigation consultant in trade secret and patent cases. What that means is I write reports um, for the court and for lawyers in very 
sophisticated, high technology cases where I explain the technology, I research the source code, I read the source code, um, I probe with it, I, I play with it, and then I write a report to the parties explaining uh, how the technology works. And as part of that, I have to do a lot of research into the way technologies evolve and, and how they develop. And this actually tells us quite a bit about why it is so hard for science fiction writers to get the future right. So I will use the smartphone as an example, okay? So the smartphone is considered one of the touchstone technologies of our era. Um, that capacitive touchscreen uh, is one of the most important innovations that made smartphones in general possible. Um, as it turns out, um, the story of how touchscreen interfaces and, 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 and uh, capacitive touchscreen interfaces in, in particular came about um, is fairly complicated. It's not as simple as, as uh, Steve Jobs invented it or Steve Jobs bought the company that invented it. It's, it's, it's way more complicated and way more interesting than that. Um, as you will see, the way a technology develops is rarely an individual genius coming up with an idea. An idea is sort of in the air. And there are lots of people trying to figure out how to accomplish that idea in different ways. And at the moment when you're, when you're standing there and different people are trying to figure out how to do something, it's really hard to know which one's going to succeed. But afterwards, after one team makes that breakthrough, everybody else follows that path. And then in retrospect, that particular path looks inevitable. But that's an illusion. That's a narrative fallacy, okay? It's a historical fallacy, a narrative fallacy. As human beings, we are very prone to those kind of cognitive errors. Because something, in retrospect, we make a story about why it makes sense, we think that's the only way it could have happened. Real life is not like that. There are many different possible paths, and one path happens to be the one that everybody follows. At the moment, impossible to predict. Afterwards, what actually happened looks inevitable. All right, so uh, I will walk you through the history of touchscreen technologies a little bit um, without talking about every single one. Um, that one up there on the upper left, 1965, that's the first working touchscreen uh, in the world. Uh, it was developed in the UK, and it uses capacitive sensing, the very same technology that ends up in the iPhone. But during that time, there were tons of teams working on different ways to implement a touchscreen. One of the more interesting ones is the one from 1982, down there in the bottom left. That one uses a frosted piece of glass at an angle. And when the user places the finger against the glass, there's a camera behind it that captures the shadow your finger cast on the glass. And the computer does process, processing based on the shadow you cast on the glass and processes that as touch input. So this is based on optical sensing, not capacitive electrical sensing. Another one that's interesting is the 1985 um, sensor frame uh, by Paul McAvaney. Um, sensor frame uh, is this little thing where you see this glowing edge around the screen. That's a bunch of little uh, light emitters and light sensors. So the screen is covered essentially in a grid of lights. Um, and when you touch something on the screen, your finger blocks uh, beams of light. And that shadow can be captured and, 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 and calculated to figure out where your fingers are and, and, and how they move. Now, you might think this sounds like a ridiculous way to do things. Well, it's not. It actually uh, is the same technology used on some of the older Kindles. Uh, the older Kindle devices actually used an infrared version of this very technology to do touch sensing. They were not true touch screens in the way we think of them. They were optical sensing devices. All right. Um, that little device in the middle from 1992, does, do people know what that is? Um, I, I think very few of you actually know what it is. That's the IBM Simon. It's the world's first smartphone, true smartphone. 
Um, this device was able to make phone calls and it kept address books and, and did lots of things. It had a, a GPS in there, I think. It did lots of things that are basically we now think of as part of the smartphone um, repertoire. And it, in fact, uh, could run apps on, on PC cards. Uh, it could send faxes and emails and all that good stuff. Uh, but IBM sold very few of them uh, because, frankly, it was incredibly expensive. And they envisioned it as a device for executives and salespeople, uh, not as a device for average people. Um, so the IBM Simon, even though it's an important piece of technology, was not the direct ancestor to the iPhones and the Androids that all of us are now using. Uh, another device that is interesting is the one on the bottom right. That's from 1998. It's called the Gesture Pad from Fingerworks. It's by John Elias and Wayne Westerman, uh, his PhD student. These two uh, created uh, a, a, a pad, a replacement for keyboards that allows you to do a rich set of gestures to interact with your computer. Uh, it turns out that Fingerworks uh, was the company that Apple bought. and. Uh, uh, many years later, their technology evolved into what eventually would become the iPhone. Uh, Diamond Touch, 2001. This is one uh, from Mitsubishi Research in Cambridge, uh, where I'm from. Um, the Diamond Touch is an amazing device. Uh, this is a huge table on which uh, users would sit on uh, stools that are connected by electrodes to the table. So one of the cool things about this touch table is that it can be used by multiple users and the table can tell who is touching where. The table can actually tell different users apart. That's a technology that uh, Apple's technology and Microsoft's technology are not really capable of, 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 of uh, replicating. Um, and that was considered a potential route to a usable touch screen interface. Um, and uh, 2005, down there, um, is something called Perceptive Pixel by uh, uh, an inventor named Jeff Hahn. Um, Jeff is actually responsible for a lot of the gestures that now become part of our vocabulary, the, the pinch to uh, zoom and all the rest of that stuff. <clears throat> okay. Uh, 2007, we had the iPhone, and uh, in the same year, we have the Microsoft Surface Table. The point is, there were literally 20 or 30 different teams who came up with different approaches to a touch screen interface in the years between 1965 all the way up to the year when the iPhone came out. If you were one of the individuals involved in that research or, a, or an investor back during that era, you would not have known which one of these would have come ahead. There was capacitive sensing, resistive sensing, optical sensing, ultrasonic sensing, shadows, projections, uh, processing by computer, processing by multiple different computers. All these approaches were used. And ultimately, the one that was backed by Apple succeeded. But that was not something anybody could have predicted at the moment. Okay, but, 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 once we're past that stage, when we're beyond that point, every phone looks like that, okay? Now, it creates the illusion that this was the only way. This was the path. It's not, it's not. This is why it's so hard for science fiction writers to predict the future, because we live in the moment. We are not beyond that future point. When we look around, at possibilities, they're all like those touchscreen models. We don't know which one's going to succeed. And once we get past it, everyone's going to think, well, that was obvious. That was the path that, sh that, that you should have predicted. Well, it's not. Um, another thing to think about is technology evolution can also be really, really unpredictable because that that kind of path dependency I was describing earlier is not universal. Sometimes when a latecomer comes into a field, they have an advantage over the incumbent because they don't have to replicate every stage of how the incumbent went through. A lot of developed nations develop their cell phone networks after landline networks were very established. 
But in many parts of the developing world, they, they never had a landline to, to deal with. And so they could actually push out 3G, 4G networks much faster than the developed world simply because they could skip over that stage. That stuff is also not obvious uh, uh, at the moment, but in retrospect, inevitable. A couple more examples. This is the world's very first web page. Tim Berners-Lee. You're literally looking at the world's very first web page. At that moment, this was the entirety of the web. Now, do you think Tim Berners-Lee could have predicted that just a few decades afterwards, this is one of the most valuable applications of his technology? <laughs> or that you would have a tiny hermit kingdom threatening the world using that technology and nobody being able to do anything about it. Or that all of us in our ignorant bliss are in fact running bits of code to mine cyber currency for the Pirate Bay. Okay? These are things that actually we do. These are not things uh, that, that, that the inventor of the web could have predicted. Technology has a way of generating secondary applications and effects that are impossible to predict from the moment when you start. When, when the web was invented, it was seen as a, as a medium for both writing and reading. It was primarily seen as a medium, believe it or not, for readers, for writers. That is not what the web is used mainly for today. All right, one more example. That's Thomas Edison standing next to a car. That's another three cars in New York right around the turn of the century, about the same period. And that's a Model T. Now, at the turn of the century in America, this is something very interesting. Only 22% of the cars on the road were actually powered by gasoline. 38% were powered by electricity. That's the one Thomas Edison was standing next to. That's an electric car. Doesn't look very much like the Tesla, does it? But that is an electric car. And 40% of the cars were powered by steam. That's right, steampunk was real. If you were living at that moment when 40% of the cars were powered by steam and 38% by electricity, would you have bet on gasoline as the one that would win? All right? So let's talk about the future of cars, as that's a particularly relevant topic for Singapore, as, uh, as we have decided to not add any more cars to our roads. Do we think the future of cars is flying cars? Or do we think it's all about Uber? It's all about sharing, right? Sharing, sharing, sharing. Do we think it's self-driving cars? Do we think it's Tesla's Model 3? Do we think it's hydrogen cell cars? Or maybe let's, let's do something more wild. Let's think about Elon Musk's vision of giant tunnels under cities. Uh, I, I always wonder why Musk doesn't mention Singapore as a potential experimental city for, for, for this idea. Uh, uh, Musk punk is actually my favorite sci-fi genre. Uh, <laughs> Musk uh, invents these amazing visions, rockets that will take you around the world in an hour. Uh, who knows you know, how, how the regulatory approval will work, but let's go with that vision. right? Do we, do we think maybe um, an underground warren of tunnels and mazes will allow Singapore to have as many cars as, as we like? Or do we think, as uh, uh, Horace Dedio thinks, bikes will eat cars. Uh, we're not gonna have cars at all. Um, we're gonna have electric bikes, uh, which are going to replace cars altogether. Here's the thing. <laughs> I can make a case for any one of these visions as the future. And it's impossible to know which one We'll get. And, and the thing is, I guarantee you, 
if one of these visions come to fruition and become fact, uh, everybody here will, will say, well, that was obvious. How could it be otherwise? That's the nature of technological evolution. At the moment when an idea is in the air, there are thousands and thousands of possibilities. And then reality reduces that quantum uncertainty to one single vision. And all of us through on the other side will think that vision, that path was inevitable, but it's an illusion. Science fiction authors are somehow expected to navigate that impossible task of predicting the one actual realized future out of potentially millions of, of different possibilities, then of course we're gonna get it wrong. But there, there's no way that, that we're gonna get it right. All right, so after all of that, what is the point of sci-fi? If it can't predict the future, why bother reading it? Okay, well, you don't have to read it. Uh, I think the most compelling reason to read it is because it's fun. But because I'm here to give a lecture on the fate of humanity, I will try to explain some deeper reasons behind that fun. There are many different kinds of technology. I have been focusing on one particular kind, which is the technology of machines, of electrons, of energy, of, of information, of, of what we think of as, you know, technology. But technology isn't limited to machines. There are other kinds of technology. You're in fact sitting in one of the most amazing pieces of technology ever devo developed. This chamber is a chamber in which a new mode of collective decision making, not before seeing Asia, was experimented with and succeeded. Parliaments, Congresses, elections, courts, <clears throat> juries, lobbying groups, trade unions. These are also technology. They are the technology of collective decision making. All of politics and all of history, I would say, is really a history of the technology of collective decision making. When you take a te technological approach to understanding history and to understanding how things to, came to be, you sort of realize that this is by far the more relevant kind of technology. It's not as flashy as a smartphone or spaceships, but how do you make democracy work better? How do you constrain absolute power? How do you allow nations to live in peace? What kind of way of resolving disputes between states is more favorable than war? These are the kind of questions that I think are much more interesting to explore in sci-fi. And in fact, I think the most compelling sort of sci-fi that we tend to gravitate to are in fact stories about the technology of collective decision making. Two of the most enduring works of sci-fi in the 20th century are 1984 and Brave New World. Now, of course, both of these stories, both these stories are terrible as actual predictions of the future. I mean, 1984 was not like 1984, and we don't live in the brave new world. But the reason we still read these works and we return to them again and again, and works like The Handmaid's Tale, is because these are sci-fi works that are not so much focused on the machinery, but on the technology of collective decision-making or collective apathy. Now, we don't live in a brave new world or 1984, but we do live in something akin to those worlds. And in fact, I would argue we live in a world in some ways much worse than either of those visions. We live in a world in which we voluntarily, happily, in fact, we pay these companies to buy devices that we put into our homes that will listen and watch us constantly. Big Brother had to forcefully install cameras and microphones into every home. Many of us go to Google and go to Amazon and buy these devices to put them right into our bedrooms so they can hear everything we say and watch everything we do. We're happy to do that. We think 
well, it's for commerce. What's the big deal? It makes our life more convenient. So they want to sell us some more ads. It's great. Well, it turns out that most of these companies are happy to collaborate with governments to give that information away. Data is like pollution. Once it's there, it's there. Anybody can, you can't predict what's going to happen to it. The state can easily tap into it or order these companies to do it. In fact, people have argued that American technology companies should become arms of the American state. It is said that Russians have used Twitter to interfere with our election. Well, many politicians now say companies like Twitter and Facebook and Google need to act in a more patriotic manner. They should not be neutral platforms. They should, in fact, be arms of American diplomacy and statecraft. They should become simply mouthpieces of the American government. Well, you might say, what's so bad about that? Americans are democracy. Well, here's the thing. A democracy is only accountable to people who vote. America is not the world. Because those in Yemen do not vote, America will continue to sell planes to a country that will kill people in that country. Because those in Indonesia did not get to vote in the American election, one of the most beloved American presidents was happy to sit there and tacitly approve the genocide of 500,000 to a million people in that country, many of them for their ethnicity. A powerful hegemonic imperial America that controls these powerful technological platforms is one of the most dystopian visions possible. The fact that it's a democracy accountable only to Americans should terrify everyone in the globe. So what is the point of reading sci-fi? When you read 1984, you emerge out of it not with a particular vision of the future. That's not important. You come out of it with a vocabulary, a set of concepts, metaphors, for thinking about the tools of technology, the, the, the technology of collective decision making, of power wielding, of power crafting. These words, big brother, double think, thought crime, memory hole, newspeak, we have always been at war. These have become a part of our political vocabulary. When we debate the future of countries, of states, of governments, we invoke these words to guide where the future will go. Brave New World takes as its title from this quote from Shakespeare. In that world where apathy, collective apathy, is the reigning dystopian vision, the few rebels have to reach back through that commercial noise to hold on to a few bedrocks of human thought, of ancient literature, in that world of larger-than-life feelies and, 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 and stars who would seduce you with their, their more-than-real presence. The few rebels in that world reach back to these ancient words and hold on to them as the anchor of human values. It's because stories are important to us. Science fiction isn't so much about technology prediction. It's about telling stories of change, stories of how to craft the future, all right? When you read science fiction, when you come out of it, what you come out of it with is a set of, 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 of ways of, of talking about things that haven't been invented yet, a way of envisioning things that haven't existed, and, and, and of guiding the world into a direction that you want it to be. Science fiction isn't about predicting the future. It's about making the future. It's about how all of us can actually have a role in shaping and guiding 
how the future will come to be. The fact that 1984 didn't become 1984 is a triumph of that vision. Because the vocabulary of Big Brother became so pervasive and so all-consuming that governments and citizens everywhere were on guard against it. Even in the Soviet Union, even in the People's Republic of China, 1984 was a byword for what you must not allow the state to become. We do not yet have a story, I think, that quite describes the dystopian route we're walking down. I do not believe American science fiction authors, perhaps because we are American, are capable of writing a story that truly questions the role of American empire and why that's a bad thing for the world. So I hope writers from other parts of the world will come to interrogate this and not fall prey to the seductive machines being sold to you from Google, from Amazon, from Twitter, from these companies that are going to become arms of the American state. I hope writers from other parts of the world will come to think about why it is American democracy and a democratically controlled set of powerful technological companies is actually a dystopian world, not a world that we want to live in. Finally, I'll give you a positive example. So we all know about cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is this aesthetic vision of the future um, that have been very influential, really, uh, not just in the arts, but also in the way technology has been developing. Now, the person who is credited with inventing cyberpunk is William Gibson. Now, here's what most people who are geeks and nerds think about Gibson. Gibson's near total ignorance of computers and the present day hacker culture enabled him to speculate about the role of computers and hackers in the future in ways hackers have since found both irritatingly naive and tremendously stimulating. Gibson succeeded not because he was a great hacker or a technologist. He actually knew nothing about what he was talking about. He was great because he invented a set of metaphors of stories that were compelling, that allow those who do invent the future to think of directions they'd rather go and directions they did not want to go. Cyberpunk gave us the language for talking about telepresence, about mediated relationships, about cyberspace. We live in a world of accelerating change. No matter how you look at it, the pace of change is accelerating. I don't know if an AI is going to take over or if we're all going to become slaves of the AI or pets or uploading to the cloud to live as gods. But it is certain that the pace of change is faster and faster. As the world changes, we do need to learn new stories, new ways of telling stories, new languages, new vocabularies, to think about these changes. Because as a human, as the human species, we don't know how to understand something except through stories. And so science fiction is useful, not because it will give us a precise prediction of the future, but because it will, gives us a language to talk about and think about the future. Thank you. Does anyone have questions for Ken? Okay. So you're obviously someone who has made a lot of Chinese sci-fi works available to us in the English-speaking world. I'm just wondering, um, considering that perhaps you and the people whom you translate have got different worldviews, is this difference an asset or a hindrance in uh, the attempt to translate and make these visions known to the rest of the world? So this is a very interesting question, and there's no easy answer to it. Um, so the conflict between the translator and the writer is present in every translator-writer relationship. Um, I think um, the way I deal with it is to acknowledge the fact that the conflict exists and to not hide it. Uh, in the same way that I think journalists do a better job if they simply acknowledge their biases and 
state that up front and, and to speak with the voice. When I translate, I translate with the voice as well. Um, I, I make it clear that I'm not able to, um, you know, translate the original without any kind of distortion. I, I don't know what that means, uh, because translation is always an act of betrayal. Uh, you have to distort one way or another. Um, I try to respect uh, and, 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 and try to understand the original and what the author was trying to say as much as I can. Um, and then I try to preserve that in the way I translate, knowing all the time that I do distort it and, and I do have to inevitably color it with my own very American vision of how the world works and how it functions. Um, but I will say that the process of doing this has made me much more aware of how American the way I view the world is. Uh, I, I think until you travel to other parts of the world or read other books written you know, by authors in other cultures and, and try to really get into what it is they're seeing, you have a hard time seeing just how parochial and how limited your own vision is. And the process of translating Chinese authors have allowed me to see, in a lot of ways, uh, my own very American, uh, the limits of my own American vision. Okay. Uh, there was a questioner upstairs. Oh, oh hi. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you much for a really great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, just sort of three questions and uh, maybe slightly provocative. Um, I mean, you always hear the argument that futurologists get it wrong because all they do is extrapolate the current trend into the future and then, you know, like uh, horse-drawn carriages that can fly. Uh, but couldn't you turn the argument around and saying, well, all you do is exactly the same, saying, look, I looked at futurologists in the past and they got it wrong, therefore I extrapolate that trend into the future, they will get it wrong. And it's especially thinking about, you know, because um, basically the problem with this, it, it, it's a complex system, right? You have too many variables, and don't really know how they will interact. And if, if you could predict that the future, then would not be the future anymore, because it already happened. But I'm just thinking of things like quantum computing, which do say they could potentially, I'm not saying it's happening right now, but they could potentially could calculate complex systems as well, which then would give us a different way to predict the future. And just saying, because in the Victorian times, they, didn't, they got it wrong, from therefore to conclude they will get it wrong in the future, since there's an unborn extrapolation. Now, the second point about um, the role of sci-fi, um, you know, 1984, and um, when you when you apply Sorry, the same is there a question? Yes, the, the question is, how would you respond to that? Saying, look, your premise is basically almost self-defeating. You're saying, I extrapolate from the past that futurologists get it wrong. By definition, that would always mean, um, you know, you, your own extrapolation could be wrong as well. How would you respond to that? That's the first question. Second question is, if you apply the same methodology... Okay, could we ask one question at a time? Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, um, so, I, I think the question is, well, I'm, I'm simply doing this extrapolation exercise where I'm saying, look, look, people have gotten it wrong in the past, and here's my explanation for it, and therefore I extrapolate that they're going to get it wrong in the future as well. Um, sure, that's a perfectly valid response. Uh, I don't know, I don't have a response for that, because this is, this is my view of the evolution of technology, and this is my role of the limits of human cognition and, and the kind of cognitive uh, errors that we make. Um, it's, of course, an historical exercise. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm doing this based on extrapolating from the past. You're right. That, that's, that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing it based on the literature of the kind of cognitive errors that we make. Uh, but no, I, I have no idea that that, uh, that 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 is going to apply universally. Yes, somebody sitting here as a sci-fi writer could predict the future exactly right, and uh, in that case, they will make billions of dollars. Uh, we had a question on this side. Someone raised their hand. I don't remember who. Okay. Um, I was wondering, given that uh, you know, to his point about the, f it's very hard to predict the future, and also the dilemma of almost like the challenge of creating metaphors in a language for us to understand our current story and our current world. How do you choose like what stories to write? Or what, what, you know, obviously you probably have tons of ideas, so how do you choose amongst them which one do you, you know, put all of your wood behind that arrow? You know what I mean? Um, so, I don't, so, I will start by saying that I don't view my role as 
about predicting the future. Uh, I, I think a lot of sci-fi writers are actually like me. I, I, I think a lot of sci-fi writers resist the idea that we're supposed to predict the future or that we're interested really in, in, in predicting the future. Um, the kind of sci-fi I write tend to be about literalizing some sort of metaphor. Um, I, I, I like science and I like looking into research, uh, but part, partly because of my experience as a historian of, of technology, I really avoid uh, trying to make bets about what the future is going to be like. I, I try to be really cautious about it. What I end up doing, though, is I take interesting research ideas and I say, okay, let's, let's, let's pretend that this is the one that's going to win, right? Let's, let's think about what kind of interesting um, metaphors this particular technology enables. I like to write stories that are about literalized metaphors, where I use the technology as a kind of stand-in for some aspect of modernity of the human condition. You know, let's take Blade Runner. I think Philip K. Dick actually is a, is a, is a very good demonstration of the kind of aesthetic I like. PKD was not interested <laughs> at all, really, about the future. When he was writing about replicants and, 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 and so on and so forth, he was not interested in the idea of there are actually going to be these um, androids running around and, and, and I'm predicting what they're going to be like. He was interested in exploring an aspect of modernity, of alienation. Um, it's, it's the fact that all of us living in modernity, we, we go around, we feel the city dehumanizes us, okay? All of us have to live in highly unnatural ways. Uh, we squeeze into these metal tubes to get to work with hundreds of thousands of strangers and we have to resist the urge to lash out. We get into these places where we have to submit to authority from people who we don't know at all, and, and we just have to accept that, that they have authority over us. We feel like this modern world stripped us of our humanity, and we feel like we are no longer able to empathize with those around us. That's why empathy is such a core metaphor for, for that story, for Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I don't think that story is at all about actual replicants. It's about humanity. It's about we living in the modern world. And, and that's the kind of story I like to write, where I take some technological concept. I'm not terribly interested in the details. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in using it as a metaphor for exploring an aspect of the human condition. Now, because I do have a technical background, once in a while I will find a story where it's premised on some bit of research that I find particularly compelling. Uh, but those are, uh, belong to a different tradition. Okay, so we have five minutes, and I'll try to go, I think maybe question one or two questions more. Okay, uh, try to go around the room. Um, there's actually a YouTube video uh, going around. Uh, it was uh, Otter C. Clark in 1974 predicting the, the invention of the PC and the internet, and that uh, people will be able to try to commute and do their banking and buy things online. So I'm kind of puzzled by your initial uh, portion of your presentation saying that science fiction is actually bad at predicting stuff. But I think probably is that the nearer the future is, the better our predictions are. Do you agree? Um, I think we simply have different definitions of what it means to predict the future. Um, so in Paradise Lost, there was a prediction, if you will, that there are alien beings around other planets. Okay, um, I'm actually convinced that one day we will find that to be true, so we can say no to predict the future. Uh, the book of Revelation contains flying machines, so we could also say, yes, one day people will fly. I'm not particularly interested in those kind of predictions. I, I, I think the sort of predictions you're talking about are in the realm of Yes, these are things that can be done on the internet. These are things that can be done. And, uh, but, but how? What are the details? How do you secure transactions? How do, you actually, how do people actually do this? What, what, what are the social implications that come up? I mean, there have been I, predictions about interconnected networks of computers since forever, before the internet ever came about. But, that's not what's interesting. It turns out that what's more interesting is once the technology is in place, how people use it. I find it far more interesting to look at the details of how something is done and what people do with it than the bare fact that something like it was predicted. Um, you know, like I was pointing out earlier, there was a Roomba. I mean, yes, you, if you squint a little bit, that's 
that's what it is. Um, but I, I think it's far more interesting to, 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 to look at how the actual room that we ended up with is so different from that vision. Okay, I would like to have like one more question. I think this someone was has been putting up there. Was this someone? Okay, all right. Hi, um, my name is Joyce, and um, I just wanted to um, think to know what you think about your role as a Asian American sci-fi writer in a long lineage of basically white men writing about the future. Um, how do you see your role in that? And especially given that, you know, in the states now. Um, there's a, a, a whole bunch of, you know, kind of white supremacy sort of conversations around that, uh, around the conversation of like, um, you know, Asian writers, like black writers actually getting coverage in the media and stories and even representation in movies and such. Um, how do you see yourself? Uh, what is your role in that? Do you see yourself as sort of like race agnostic, ethnicity agnostic, or do you actually see you know, that part of your identity coming out or explicitly coming out in your work? Um, so I happen to be a believer in fiction as a very different rhetorical mode than um, the kind of persuasive argument uh, that I would make as a, as a lawyer. Um, so so here's, here's my, my, my feeling. Um, I don't write my fiction with the idea that they're there to carry a specific message of some sort. It's just not something I'm interested in. Um, I am politically active and I do a lot of political writing, but when I'm in that mode, I'm in a very different place mentally. Uh, what I'm doing there when I'm doing political work is I'm trying to set out a very, very clear, narrow path for the reader to walk down. I don't want you to wander off it. This is, this is what I'm trying to get you to see and you're gonna follow that path. When I'm writing fiction, it's, it's a totally different experience. I'm really trying to construct a world in which you can find your own meaning. Um, I, I, I tend to find fiction um, in which uh, the construction is very similar to the persuasion mode to be not very compelling. It, maybe it's a personal aesthetic choice, but I feel the better kind of fiction tends to be the kind of fiction in which I don't have an inherent one meaning for you to find. I have a world in which you can discover your own meaning based on what you wish to put into it and how you wish to explore it. Um, and so uh, for the kind of issues you're talking about, I don't think my fiction um, makes a clear argument one way or the other, but my fiction makes a lot of emotional uh, arguments, if you will, about what it means. I mean, for example, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go with a very simple example. So let's take my story, which a lot of people have read, called The Paper Menagerie. Uh, the Paper Menagerie has, uh, is, is a story that's being often read in a way entirely different from what I wanted it to say. But I don't really care because, you know, I wrote the story for myself and I, I know what it means to me and the fact that it's diverse and, and big and broad enough to encompass other readings is great. So here's the thing. For me, it's very much a story about the American story. Um, oftentimes, uh, I see uh, reviewers describe the story as about the child of an American father and a Chinese mother who resists assimilation and, and his, his conflict with her and, and, and his, his, his inability to pick in an identity. Uh, and I, I find that interpretation to reveal a lot more about the person doing the, the, the interpretation than it does about what my story is about. My story is about an American family, that's all. The mother is an American. The fact that she refuses to assimilate to a white norm does not make her any less American. Uh, the idea that she refuses to assimilate simply accepts that whiteness is a norm and that defines Americanness, which it does not. Um, so it's a story about an American family and, and how they come to um, fight over uh, internalized racism. That's what it's about. But, you know, that's not the only message you can take out of it. You can get other readings out of it. And I like the fact that my story is constructed in a way that allows it. I have like a script that I'm supposed to read out. There are many events to enjoy this SWF, so do continue to support the festival with your attendance.